Hey, what's going on guys? My name is Garrett Carnes. I'm a lead instructor here at Sheepdog Response. Uh, I teach all different programs that we have from uh, combatives and protector one to firearms to um, pistol, carbine, TTRC, all that kind of good stuff. But we just rolled out a precision rifle course and this is my baby. Um, I spent five years in the Marine Corps as an infantry squad leader, uh, leading squads of Marines all over the country and then overseas into Afghanistan doing multiple deployments over there um, where I stepped on an improvised explosive device on my second tour resulting in the loss of both of my legs. So that affords me the great privilege to work with you guys here at Sheepdog Response and bring to you guys the good news of long range shooting. So whenever you go to the range, you wanna bring a set of tools with you. That's kind of common sense. You should have a set of tools in your truck or in your vehicle anywhere you travel anyway. Um, but for me, I like to bring a set of fix-it sticks. The fix-it sticks are a set of essentially armor's tools um, that are mobile and I get to, get to bring this everywhere I go with me. And it has a set of uh, tools to be able to fix and adjust every single thing on every type of firearm that I bring to the range. If I'm bringing my precision rifle to the range, I should know what size torque wrenches I need for each piece of this rifle and I should probably bring a set of those to the range. The last thing you want to do is set up on the firing line and start sending rounds down range and then you find out that your scope is a little loose or your rings are a little loose or something's going on that's going to require some maintenance inside your bore or with your bolts and you don't have the proper tools there to fix it. It's a long drive to the range, it's a lot of time that you dedicate to, to getting better training in. The last thing you want to do is, is slow yourself up before you get out there. When you come to our precision rifle class, or when you go to any class at all, you should take a set of note-taking gear with you. I like to bring a couple of different types of note-taking gear, from loose leaf uh, papers to, if I'm gonna be doing precision rifle shooting, I like to have um, some type of gear where I can write down uh, some notes for myself on the adjustments that I'm gonna be making on the firing line. So I'll write down um, atmospheric conditions, temperature, I'll plot my shots, all the good stuff that you're gonna learn at the Precision Rifle course as we teach you and go along, you're gonna to wanna to record your data. And the only way that you can do that is with a set of note-taking gear. I understand that it's 2023 and we all have a, a cell phone with us and in our pocket. The cell phone's great to reference back to, but on the firing line and in the moment, it's pretty easy to just grab a pen, jot a note down for yourself, call a shot, um, write a note to yourself for the future. And then later on what I'll do is I'll log that note into my cell phone and I keep a record of, of all of my uh, training for myself. That way I can go back and see what I did on a certain day or if I'm you know, struggling with something out there on the firing line, I can refer back to these notes. What I also like to bring with me on the range is a wristband. The wristband comes in many shapes and sizes. You can buy swoopy ones online specifically for um, tactical training. I bought this, uh, it looks like the brand is Cutters from uh, Academy Sports or Dick Sporting Goods or, or you know, a typical sporting goods store like that. And it's a quarterback wrist coach for, I believe it's for like the size of a seven year old kid. Um, but I stretch this thing with my massive forearms. All right, and what I do is I put my, um, my information inside of these index cards. Uh, I'll leave it in there for you. I'll put information inside of these index cards when I know what ranges that I'm gonna be shooting at. So if I know I'm gonna be shooting at 300 yards, 407 yards, 581, whatever it is, I can start to put my dope or my data on previous engagement, which we'll talk about in our precision rifle course. Um, I can put that ahead of time on this wrist coach and I use my notes in order to get the, the information and plot it onto this thing. That way when I set up behind my rifle, I can take a look real quick at my dope and then I can dial that thing in on my optic and I can send rounds down range quick, fast, and in a hurry. The last thing I wanna mention about note-taking gear is we're gonna spend a lot of time in the classroom. There's a lot that gets into pre precision rifle shooting and while we only have you for eight hours, we do cram a lot of information and knowledge your way. And so while we're giving you formulas and mathematical equations up on the whiteboard, I'd like for you to challenge yourself by writing down these equations and doing the math yourself. It's good for, again, you to go back to and reference to. Um, I have been shooting precision for a long time and there are still things that my brain just does not want to remember, but I have a long list of notes and, and uh, textbooks that I've been able to refer back to over the years. So in this next segment, we're gonna talk about ammo. A lot of shooters, when they come to the course, they have to make a decision of you know, what rifle are they gonna bring or what type of ammo they're gonna bring. Especially for guys who are building a rifle for the first time or going to purchase something off of the shelf, there's a million different types of ammunition out there, different calibers, um, different grains, different loads. It can get overwhelming. So what I want to talk about real quick with you guys is a couple of do's and a couple of don'ts, it's generics. Um, this right here, this is a 338 Lapua. 
This is a really large round and it's great for doing massive amounts of damage to large game if you want to go moose hunting or elk hunting, uh, hunting out in the mountains or out west. Um, but what it's not good for typically is bringing to a range that you're unfamiliar with or for the first time visiting and you get told right at the gate, hey, we don't allow you to shoot 338 Lapua on our steel out here. It's a wasted trip, it's a lot of waste of money, there's a lot of you know, sad tears and boo-hoo. So I don't want to see you guys come out to one of the ranges bringing this giant load, getting all excited and American about it, and then we have to tell you, hey, range regulations are turning you away. Sorry, man, we can't have you shoot out here. What I have here is the 308. 308 is kind of like the granddaddy of precision rifle shooting. Um, this thing is good for going down range overseas for our U.S. military. It's good for uh, SWAT snipers back here in the United States. It's also great for target shooting and big game hunting here in the United States. Uh, what I love about the 308 is if you want to get into real precision shooting and learning how to make good wind calls and, and wind, wind readings, as you get out to further distances, this round is going to be heavily impacted by the wind, uh, by the wind just by the way that the round is um, you're following its trajectory on its way to the target. As the wind starts to grab hold of this round and move it, you're going to have to become really good at making wind call adjustments. So this is a really good round for kind of all things in general precision shooting, but when you want to shoot really long range, it's really good for um, making good wind calls. Now next is kind of the new bee's knees, and this is called the 6.5 Creedmoor. This is what a lot of shooters are bringing to, to matches nowadays, or they're bringing out there to, to shoot with their buddies. Uh, when they're building rifles, there, there's a lot of 6.5 Creedmoor um, rifles that are being built. It's a great round. It's a phen phenomenal round. Um, it's kind of like the, the big or little brother of the 308, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, and there's a lot of capabilities that this round has, uh, but it's not going to be affected by the wind as much. And so that's a good thing, but if you really want to get good at the art of wind calls, um, the 308 might be where you want to go. Um, there's nothing wrong with the 6.5 Creedmoor as all. Uh, as well. There are um, tons of other rounds out there like the 243, the 260, 7 millimeter. All are completely acceptable to bring to uh, Revley Peak range that we teach at here in Austin, Texas. Um, but as we start to extend the precision rifle course across the country, uh, make sure that you're always checking with the regulations of the range that we're going to be hosting our courses at. Probably the most important thing that you bring to the range with you, no matter what type of training you're doing, is your medical gear. So I have with me here the Sheepdog Response um, IFAT kit. This thing's loaded with everything that you would need in a medical emergency on the X to treat yourself um, in the event of an emergency on the firing line. You should have at least with you a minimum of a tourniquet to help yourself. Um, and then whatever else you want to pack into your kit yourself is completely up to you. Our kits come completely packed with um, a whole bunch of goodies that our director uh, of program, Matt Smith, has decided to put in these, uh, in these kits specifically for you. Uh, you can pick and choose what you want to put into your medical kits, but just make sure that you have it with you and you have it within one arm's reach. And on that note, while we're talking about safety on the range, always make sure that you bring a set of eye protection and ear protection. The, the big earmuffs, the electronic earmuffs, that's what I like to use, but if you have big, chunky, honey bun ears, like Director of Training Yako Kalili, then you might want to get the earplugs to put in there as well. Um, as we get out there on the firing line at our courses at Sheepdog Response, we're going to be talking to you guys and giving you guys real-time adjustments on the firing line. So it's preferred to have some form of electronic hearing while you're out there, because when there's 30 rifles going off next to you, precision rifles at that, they're pretty loud, and I'm telling you to make an adjustment uh, in your elevation, you'll want to be able to hear me. It's not necessarily um, required for the course, but I do highly recommend electronic. All right, let's talk rifles. This is what we came here for. So what I have in front of me is my own personal 308 rifle. This is a Steyr a THB SBS. That stands for Tactical Heavy Barrel Safety Bolt System. Um, there are many different varieties of precision rifles out there, different custom builds, builds that you can buy off the shelf that are pretty precise and accurate um, right out of the box. Uh, but this rifle is something that I took a lot of special care in putting individual pieces on. And so we're gonna talk about it real quickly. We're going to start at the muzzle brake. Now, with precision rifles, you typically want to have some type of a muzzle brake on there. I understand that a lot of shooters are going to come to our course with old school hunting rifles with the wooden stock, and that's completely acceptable. It's perfectly fine. Um, the muzzle brake, what this helps with, is that it helps with the recoil on a large rifle like this, especially if you're starting to shoot like 300 wind mags or shoot you 338s at ranges that you can shoot it or when you go hunting. Um, I've had shooters come up to me weeks after the course and they tell me, hey, I put that muzzle brake on my rifle and that thing is a pleasure to shoot now. Compared to beforehand, it was kind of giving them PTSD after every single round that they would shoot and it's the opposite of a pleasure to shoot. So I have a Surefire muzzle brake on this thing specifically to be able to put a SOCOM 2 Surefire uh, suppressor onto it or a can. Um, now, we'll get into suppressors in a little bit here, um, but the, the muzzle brake is completely fine. And if you don't have the muzzle brake, it's completely fine as well. It's just some food for thought. 
Moving next into the barrel. So this is a Steyr barrel and it's chambered in 308 once again. This is a heavy barrel and you can see it's slightly fluted. The fluting takes away a little bit of the weight to make the rifle a little bit lighter. As you can imagine, this is a pretty heavy rifle and it's not necessarily built for going out and, and climbing tree stands. I've done that with prosthetic legs. Um, don't tell my wife about that. Uh, she'll find out if she watches this video. Uh, but it does try and lighten the load up on this rifle just a little bit. Uh, but this thing is mainly built to be shot exactly how it's sitting right here, is on some type of bench or on the ground or on a rooftop or, or on a table. Uh, the longer the rifle, the general rule of thumb is the longer the, um, the barrel of the rifle, the more accurate and more precise the round is gonna be. The round has a greater opportunity to twist as the, it moves down the rifling of the barrel and the round is exposed to gravity just a little bit less while it's in a longer barrel. So this is a 26 inch barrel. Again, if you show up with a little bit of a shorter barrel, that's not the end of the world, it's not a big deal. Um, but if you're looking to build a rifle, 24, 26 in inches for really accurate and precise shooting, that's kind of where you, the world that you wanna live within. As we move down the rifle, we're gonna move into the bipods. There's a million different varieties of bipods that you can purchase out there. Probably the most common that you'll see out there, uh, you can buy them on the shelf, is this, uh, the Harris bipods. Harris are great, I love them. I used them when I was in the Marine Corps on my AR. Um, we had precision shooters using Mark 12s and even snipers um, out there with Harris bipods. They're a great set of bipods. Uh, what I have on my rifle, these are called Atlas. This has kind of taken hold of the precision rifle shooting world as far as the being the marquee um, uh, bipods. Uh, there are, again, tons of other great brands out there. This is just what I prefer to shoot. What you want to look for in your bipods is these to telescope and be able to change elevations. So I can change these bipods by unlocking this collar at the top, and then I drop it down into these little notches. That way I can change, depending on the terrain or, or where I'm at, where I'm shooting from, I can change the elevation of the front of my rifle. What I can also do is push a button and I can move these feet forward and they lock into different angles and different positions. And we can get real crazy with it if we're on some type of crazy terrain or a slope or a barricade or something like that. And I can also move them, as you can see, to the rear or forward. What you also want to look for in a set of bipods is they want to have the ability to cant. And what I mean by cant is if you watch this rifle, it'll slightly move back and forth on the bipods. I want to have the cant, in, uh, the cant ability in the set of bipods because as I start to shoot longer ranges, I have to make sure this gun is completely level. Now, if you take a look at some of the information that we've put out there for how to properly mount your optic to your rifle, you're gonna know that if you do it the right way, your optic is gonna be level to your rifle. And as I move down the rifle, we're gonna skip ahead just for a moment and talk about the level. I use this level to make sure that my rifle is completely level to gravity. And so I can do that by moving the rifle back and forth using this cant feature on the set of bipods. What I recommend to look for in a set of bipods, or at least to stay away from, is the, the panning ability. And you can see right here, my rifle will move back and forth on the bipods, and that's called panning, or a pan. I prefer not to have the pan, because when you're shooting targets that are moving from left to right, or right to left, we don't move with the target on the bipod. What we don't uh, lead the target while, while it's trying to move. What we do is we ambush it. We set the sights where that target, where that, uh, target is going to move to, and then we can uh, let the round break. So panning, uh, I believe that Atlas has come out with a couple of other sets of bipods that don't have the pan feature. I just tighten this nut up as tight as I can go on the bottom to try and take that out. Uh, but because I'm shooting such a high pressure round, this, this large 308 caliber, when I do shoot, the bipods will pan just a little bit. And after a few rounds, I'll have to make an adjustment. It takes me out of my shooting position, which I'll have to rebuild. And it just takes me an extra second to get rounds down range. One more feature that I want you to look for in a set of bipods is these bipods roll back and forth. Now the original uh, Atlas bipods, they have this feature. This is a set of the original Atlas bipods. And these are no good for if you're shooting on the hood of a car or on concrete, because as I go to shoot, they essentially turn into a set of wheels. And again, the rifle will start to move around all over the place, breaking your shooting position. So I highly recommend not having a set of wheels or a set of tires underneath your rifle when you're trying to completely stabilize the shooting platform before you send rounds down range. Um, some people like it, it's just not my cup of tea. As we move up into what the meat and potatoes of this rifle is, this thing is sitting on a custom McMillan stock. There are tons of different uh, bodies for a rifle. They're called stocks or they're called chassis. This is a traditional, um, it's custom, but it's, it's more of a traditional world uh, synthetic stock. And as my barrel sits inside of the stock and connects to my action, which is right here where the bolt is, I wanna make sure that my barrel is free floated. 
What that means is this barrel is touching nothing but the muzzle brake that it's connected to or the suppressor if you have a suppressor on the end and the action where the barrel connects right here to the rifle. This stock that the rifle is sitting in, it's cupped like this for the barrel to sit right inside of, but the barrel does not touch any part of this stock. The reason why I want a free floated barrel is I want this barrel to be touching as little as possible. All right, when we get into barrel harmonics and when we shoot the round with you know, barrel whip is occurring, um, there's a whole bunch of crazy things that happen when you shoot around. And I want as little impact on this barrel as possible to, um, to have play in where this round is gonna go. Now, this is especially important when you start to move into uh, gas rifles. So there's a big debate going on right now about the bolt rifle versus the gas rifle because traditionally, the bolt rifle was the way to go for precision shooting. But that, is, that, that day is dead, it's, it's no longer here because the technology that we have today uh, to be able to put into gas rifles, they can get up there and compete with, if not surpass the ability of a bolt gun to be able to be precisely shot. Then it kind of evens the playing field and it's on the shooter and the shooter's ability to learn his equipment, which is what we're here for at Precision Rifle. It'd be great if I had a, a carbine uh, to be able to show you guys. Um, oh, I actually work at Sheepdog Response, so. Luckily, we've got rifles and weapon systems all over the place. So what I have right here is a carbine precision rifle, or it can be used as a precision rifle. And the reason why I wanna show you this rifle specifically is because it has a free floated barrel. You can see it's got a bunch of swoopy gear on it. It even has a, a beloved Eagle Globe and Anchor right here in the magazine well. Don't tell Tim about that. All right, but this barrel is free floated, which means as it goes into this handrail right here, or the handguard, it's technically not touching anything until it connects right here to the upper receiver of the rifle. If this handguard was old school, like the A2 M16s, it would connect, um, it would connect to the fore end of the rifle right here. Um, and let me correct myself actually, the barrel is touching the gas block with the gas tube, but that's inside the, uh, the handguard right here, you don't see, and it doesn't really have an impact on the, on the barrel. But the great thing about this is I can hang anything I want to on this rifle right here and it's not going to hang on the barrel. As I start to attach different attachments to the, the handguard, it's going to add weight. And as I add weight, it's going to pull just slightly on the handguard the further I move the weight, like the set of bipods here, the further I move the weight away from the upper receiver. And all of that is going to have an impact on the barrel right here as it slightly pulls down and it's going to have a say in where my rounds land. <laughs>